Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We can all find our seats. I know it's a beautiful Sunday out there. And oh, sorry. It's nice, really nice weather, and we've been all over really chatting. But we're going to try and start church kind of close down time. We're getting closer each week. Um, so in about six months, we might have this down. All right. If you guys could all uh, bow your heads in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning, Lord. Lord, let's just enter our hearts into worship. Get a little closer to you this morning so that we can uh, just really get into your word and message today. Lord, we just thank you for the fellowship that we can have with uh, the friends that we have here in our church. Lord God, we just thank you for that. In the name of God. Amen. All right, well, we'll ask you all to stand and sing with us. Uh, this first one should be pretty familiar to you guys, so hopefully that makes it because you'll notice.
also we have posters that if any of you know of a business that you think would like to contribute to Operation Business Travel, you know, gifts, items, um, ask permission to, you know, have them maybe hang this up in their place of business so anyone that comes in can scan the code and make a donation, or even the business itself, which would be wonderful. All right? So this is something that um, Don was working on. I think he did a beautiful job. Um, so we don't want to waste these because these are, again, ways for the great commission to be done. And we don't have to speak, which is what I like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so please take the box from the code or fill the box online using the QR code. All of this can be found on our website, too, by the way. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me Alright, you heard her. No one leaves without a box. I'm sure Angie's going to grab a dozen of them. Um, Alright, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can open up to Genesis. That's where we'll be for a while yet, although we're making, we're making progress. At the very end of chapter 27, and then uh, and then we're going to cover chapter 28 here today. Uh, I realized something this morning when I was here. Actually, I realized it last week. So it's been several weeks since we had the Lord's Supper. So I'm just going to say this so that everybody can hold me accountable because I thought about it last week and then I didn't act on it. So I'm saying it out loud and publicly. We're going to have the Lord's Supper next week. Okay, so. If you show up and I don't have it set up, you're going to have to set me down to dollar or generally get some crackers. <laughs> All right. Um, let's pray together and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for <clears throat> the gifts that you give to your, your children. and Thank you for their willingness to, uh, to share them. Um, Lord, we... We come to you today with an assortment of things on our minds and in our hearts. And so we pray that you would uh, help us to just let those go, that we might just sit at your feet this morning and we might just worship you as we did through song, um, now through your word, that you might be glorified in all that we say and sing and do here today. I pray for um, this Operation Christmas Child program. Just uh, thank you for Patty and Kathleen and John and, and people who are passionate about that and uh, the spreading of your gospel. We do pray, Lord, that you would use it um, to bring many to yourself, that many would come to know you through this through this program. Um, and we just thank you ahead of time for all that you'll do with that. We love you and we look to you now. In Jesus' name. All right. Um, last week we kind of, as we were as we were wrapping up, we saw uh, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob had stolen his brother's blessing and deceived his father um, at his mother's request, by the way. So he wasn't he wasn't alone in that decision. Mom kind of sent him in to to do it, but. In her defense, she had been told by God that he would be ahead of her, right? You know, or ahead of her, uh, ahead of his brother. Um, obviously, that doesn't excuse her behavior, but um, that's where we find ourselves. And at this point, Esau now is just mad, and rightfully so, to the point where where his mother overhears him. Say you know, as soon as as soon as pops goes away, I'm taking I'm taking him out. I'm gonna take my brother out. He's that angry, and so um, Rebecca says to Isaac. Well, she he. It's funny she she approaches Isaac after she hears this, and she says to Isaac, 
um, it would just grieve me. My life would be worthless if my if if Jacob marries one of these Hittite women. Now this is this is pretty uh, conniving on her part. You know you don't necessarily it's not as easy to catch in the text, but but what she's doing is she's going to Isaac, who is already upset that this happened. Right? He wanted to bless Esau. Esau was his favorite, and. They deceived him, and he ends up giving that blessing to Esau or to, to Jacob. And um, after this, towards the end, after after Rebecca overhears Esau's anger and and him wanting to take the life of his brother, she kind of goes to him and makes it his idea. Oh, I'd just be so grieved if my son marries one of these Hittite women. Canaanite women, right? Remember we talked about how the Canaanites are sometimes a specific people and then other times a the, the pagans living in Canaan. And that would include the Hittites, which Esau had wives from. So Esau had several wives at this point and they were not um, they were from the Hittite tribes and the, and the Canaanite tribes. So she kind of she kind of cons old Isaac into thinking that this is his idea, and so as we pick up in chapter twenty-eight, it says that Isaac called Jacob. So he calls Jacob to himself and blessed him and directed him, "You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters." of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Padan Haram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. So he sends him back where he found Rebecca. Right. This is where this is where Isaac went to go. Uh, or the servant was sent to find the find the wife for Isaac from there. And so he sends him there to I don't freak out to to find a cousin to marry. Right. That's what essentially happens here. And I know that to us just is weird. It doesn't make sense. But for a, a whole bunch of reasons, we won't spend too much time getting into that. That was, you know, that was an appropriate response in that context. And so Rebecca really wants him, more so than just to marry. I mean, I think she doesn't want him to marry a Hittite, but but he all he she really doesn't want him killed by Esau. So he she sends him away and. And gets Isaac to kind of uh, give that order. Goes on in verse 6 and says, Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Haram to take a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Padan Haram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as a wife, took his wife besides the wives he had. Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Nebaioth. Um, now, Esau's upset, right? And so much so that, that he's... He, he hears his father say this to his brother, but he's so upset about him losing his birthright, which he gave up, and, and being conned out of his blessing from his father that he goes out and marries a Canaanite woman just despite the whole situation. Now, I know none of us ever act in spite, right? Okay, maybe, maybe occasionally we do. But you see, what happens is oftentimes what, what ends up happening in this situation is Esau hurts himself, right? He, he, he's so angry that he, I'm going to get my dad back, I'm going to get my brother, I'm going to get everybody back, I'm going to go against everything that they would want for me. 
this is one of the reasons why when we when we make decisions, what and I am listen, I'm as guilty as the next person. Oftentimes we react and we often react and act out of spite. I, I, I remember being a kid, a teenager, and I used to get in trouble at school all the time. And half the time it wasn't my fault. Right? I just, I mean, it really wasn't. I'd get called into the office and, and they'd be like, I think you, you, you were part of this situation, you know. We'll, we'll make it generic. Writing on the walls. I never wrote on the walls, but, you know, it was other things. And, and it was true that I, I spent enough time in trouble that there was reason for them to think that. But after a while, I would start being like, well, what's the point? Might as well do this stuff. I, mean, I, I get in trouble for it already. See, this is the kind of behavior, it's not rational when we think about it. If we stop and think, we think, well, why would I do that? I'm just hurting myself, which I did. I ended up in more trouble all the time. And I was guilty. So instead of pronouncing my innocence and saying, hey, I really didn't have a part of this, you know, I, I, I just felt victim to the very thing that I was being accused of. That's similar to what happens with Esau right here. He says, listen, if everything's been taken from me, I'm, I'm just going to act opposite and contrary to my parents' wishes. And it brings harm to himself. Right? It doesn't bring blessing. It doesn't bring goodness into his life. It doesn't bring grace. Instead, it brings conflict. In verse 10, Jacob now leaves and it says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. I just stop right there. I just like, I want to have that dream. <laughs> right? Don't you just want to have that dream? And, and, and I point that out because, because sometimes we think we've missed something. Right? And I don't want to give away my, where I'm going to go with this. But I read that and I'm just like, man, I want to go. I want to put my head on a stone or I mean, a pillow. I'd rather have a pillow. But... You know, I want to put my head down and I want to dream at night and I want to see a ladder to heaven and seeing the angels descend and ascend. And it's like, man, what a, what a comfort that must have been to him to see that, right? To see this ladder to heaven. I was going to title this sermon Stairway to Heaven, but I thought it was a bad idea. Um, the kids probably don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what? Uh, that, it's, it's, a, it's a song from my youth. Um, so he goes on. So he lays his head down and he sees this. He, he, he dreams, right? He has this dream and he sees this ladder with the angels descending and ascending. And behold, the Lord stood above it. Now it gets even better. Right? Like now you don't just see the engine, but now the Lord is standing above it. And said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now that's kind of cool right there because what just happened? We just got blessed by him acknowledging. So, so that he, God always intended Jacob to be the rightful heir, right? We know that. And that it, how it played out is one thing, but that was always what was going to happen. And so that the promise made to Abraham is now passed down to Jacob, first to Isaac and then to Jacob. And, and I love it that it says that all the families of the earth will be blessed. Right? Sometimes we read the Old Testament and we think, well, those are, you know, 
Jacob becomes Israel and the Jewish nation is born. And so these blessings are all for them. But that's not what that said, right? That those blessings are for us, right? It's not just the land of Canaan. I mean, there's that part of it, but there's this wider plan that God has. This, this gathering of all his people, Jews, Gentiles alike, a gathering of his people for himself. And then again, one of my favorite words, Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took a stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the, at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So a couple of things that we see happen. I mean, first of all, we see Jacob flee, right? He, it probably was a hard to talk Jacob into leaving, right? His mom says, look, your brother's going to kill you. you got to go, right? So when your dad tells you, I'm going to get your dad to tell you to go and find a wife, and, and off you go. So he, he takes off. But then he, although ill we his blessing seems to be kind of ill-gotten gain to us, right? The way it came about, his deception, his deceiving. But God comes to him. He lays his head down and he has this dream. And God comes to him and he says, you are the promised heir. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you. I will provide for you. I will give you, I will, I will give you this land. And your descendants will be like the sand of the desert, right? I mean, just, you will not be able to count them. And you, you get this feeling that, that Jacob, up until this point, was not really like a godly man, right? It's not like, he says, God is in this place, and I did not know it. Like, did he even know God? I mean, his, his father did, and he had, he had obviously been taught all of the blessings that have been passed down. He would have known these things, but I don't think that's where his mind was. And then all of a sudden, this God comes to him and says, I am the Lord. I am the Lord Almighty. I'm here. And Jacob, after this response, how? Well, appropriately. See, when we encounter God, We've seen this with Abraham. We've seen it with Isaac. When we encounter God, the appropriate response is what? To worship. Set up an altar. When I was reading this this week, I was going through and I said, man, do I... How often do I see God act or move and I fail? I mean, I thank Him, right? It's, it's part of my vernacular. Thank you, Jesus. Right? And, and, and that's good. That's a good thing. But I mean to pause and to worship. Thank you for your provision for today. There is always something to sit at His feet and worship Him for. And often, I'm afraid in my own life, I see day after day after day go by where I do not do that. I do not do that. Where we, you know, in our Christian belief class, we're, we're at this we're on the chapter of what is man. And real, real, a real just kind of a summary of what is man. Why were we created? What is our purpose? Why are we here? Right? 
first of all, we're the pinnacle of his creation. And we were created for a purpose. And your purpose, now I can't tell you what job God wants you to have, who your spouse is, and I can't tell you any of those things. But I can tell you what your purpose on this earth is. And that's to glorify God. Simply glorify God. And one of the ways that we glorify Him is by acknowledge, acknowledging Him through worship. And not just on Sunday morning. We call that, you know, like, I, I wish we could find a better name for it. Hey, let's go to worship, right? Like, I, I wish there was a better name because worship is so much more than us singing or us sharing the Word. That's all part of it. But like when we open this Bible on Sunday morning and we, and we come together, I, I hope that we come with the attitude of worship. I mean, I want us to learn, right? I want us to, I want us to have good doctrine. I want us to have all those things. But there's, it's, it's more. I, I, I read this quote this week, and it, it, it was something like this: is that, is that, uh, knowing God is not having right doctrine. But it's not less. I love that quote. Because that, that validates me, right? Because I like doctrine and I want all those. Well, I like my ducks in a row. I want to understand things as a whole. I want to understand scripture as a whole. I don't like to take things out of context. I like it. I, I want to see the whole story of God's redemptive plan. <clears throat> but it's not just that. There's a lot of people with good doctrine. And they don't know God. There is Bible professors and scholars that can read and write Hebrew and Greek and everything, and, and, and they, they probably know more about the text of this Bible than any of us. And they do not know God. It's just that simple. There's a difference. And so we don't want that to be a disconnect for us. See, I think that's where Jacob found himself as he had this dream. He, he had been taught all these things. He knew some things. But he didn't know God. And here he encounters God. And his response is so right on. What? Sometimes I, you know, I said what well, parents things, I always get teary. I, I think I wish, you know what I wish I would do? I wish I would have the courage to fall on my face and worship. I'm always so worried about what somebody might think or, or say or wonder. That guy is insane. I am. I want to be. I want to be crazy for Jesus. I, I mean, any call me. The Bible says we're supposed to be a peculiar people, right? <laughs> now, I'm not, and I don't mean make a spectacle of yourself, but I mean authentic, real worship. Right? Jacob uses a word here. My brother, the way he don't like to throw this word around because it's an important word, right? He says, this place is awesome. We throw that word around. It's kind of like love in our language. I love cheeseburgers. I love my truck. I love baseball. Right? That's not the same. It's not what it means. Right? Those things bring me enjoyment, but it's fleeting. Right? And, and love is something much deeper, and so is awesome. What happens here, I mean, the, just think about it. We use that word in our language. Like, oh man, those fireworks were awesome. But listen to how, how it's described here is that is that then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it, and he was afraid. The awesomeness of God should produce in us the fear of God. And we don't like to throw that word around either, like, like, oh well, we you know we don't mean that he's like all powerful and could crush us like an ant. Well, he can. You know, it's not a fear that he would, but he could. It's an awestruck, 
what we what we contemplate can contemplate God, we should be awestruck. It should move us to a place where like, is there anything more awesome than him? Is there anything I'm gonna do this week that that would bring awe into my life? And I don't mean awe, right? Like I'm gonna do a whole bunch of that, but but I mean just the awesomeness of God to stand there in his presence. Oh. That's what we should be doing here on Sunday. That's how we should be coming in here. And if we're not there when we get here, then go tell a brother or go tell a sister, I'm not there. Would you pray with me? Would you would you just remind me of who we're about to worship? Tears should blow up in our eyes. It's okay to be emotional about God. Right? We don't need to be all Swedish, Norwegian, Stoics. It's okay to let it go. Right? That's what the church is supposed to be like. Then when we worship, maybe we set up a stone and pour oil on it and fall on our faces and say, oh God, how awesome are you? How great is our God? Not just good doctrine. Right? Our heart should be moved towards Him. Good doctrine is only good if it moves you towards Him. If it's just up here, it will do you zero good. It's got to get down here. Right? It's got to move our hearts. So I love the way Jacob responds here. Now, in this text, as, we, as we're taking that away, I, I, I couldn't help but feel like, whoa, Jacob... You know, he really was blessed and he got to uh, experience this dream. And he seen this ladder to heaven and at the top was God. It's like, yeah, that would be super cool. And this is this is where I want us to go here this morning. All right? It's very easy to read that story and say, that that's Jacob, and that's awesome that that happened for him. But I've never experienced that. I've never seen that. Or maybe you have. And maybe we just need to be reminded about it. And maybe more importantly, we need to be reminded of the age in which we live. In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 15, it says this, Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Okay. That's where we're at today. Did you hear that? I don't need to have a dream because I live under the new covenant. I, Jesus has done all and you're thinking, okay, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, but still, it would be super cool if I could just have a dream. If I could just see something tangible, if I could just touch it. And you have, you know. You have. Well, some of you young people don't have kids yet. But this is one, just one example. When you hold your baby, Jameson was born, and I was in there. I think much to Angie's dismay, but she acted like she wanted me to go the whole time. But anyway, she, when he was born, they took him, right? They take him right away, and they take him over to the table and make sure everything is kind of copacetic. 
and then they brought him over, we put her, put him on Angie, and and then the nurse handed him to me. And I'm holding him, and I was awestruck. And all that I could do, all that flooded my mind and my heart, was just like, what kind of God does this? And I and I just I did I didn't know what to say, and I just said, oh Lord. My cup runneth over. Like I couldn't, I couldn't contain any more in me. I couldn't contain it. It was literally just overflowing out of me. This God, Jesus, is our mediator. You see, He's reconciled us to the awesome God of the Old Testament, right, that we read about. That's what Jesus did. It says He forgave our sins, right, our, trans our transgressions. That had to be done. There had to be a sacrifice made for our sin. But there's more than that that happened. He reconciled us to the Father. Reconciled us. Made us in right relationship with Jesus. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have been reconciled to the awesome God of the Old Testament. Right? You've been reconciled to Him. You can converse with Him. You can sit with Him. You can cry to Him. You can cry out to Him. You can stand in awe of Him. Because the same God who parted the Red Sea is that very same God that you've been reconciled to. And He still works miracles. That's why I bring up the baby thing. If you've ever seen a baby after it was born, especially your own, you, are, you do believe in miracles. You do. Because it's a miracle. And it's a miracle that any of them will make it past two, but you know what I mean? I've been a nervous wreck ever since, but you know, I, but I mean that that moment of the blessing. Now, I'm not done, so hang with me. Last week, last week I was I wanted to do this so bad, but I think it's even better this week. Because like I said, we find ourselves wishing that we had something. I want what Jacob had. I want to walk and talk with God like Abraham did. I mean, you read those stories, and it's like he's walking. It's like they're walking. And at one point, he is walking with the incarnate Christ, right? As they come and overlook Sodom and Gomorrah, he's walking and talking with Jesus. You ever think when, we, when you read the Gospels and you think about the the disciples and you think, how did these guys not get it? They were walking with him. And we always want, like, I, hey, if I was around and he was turning loaves, you know, if he was turning fish and feeding 5,000 and he was multiplying loaves and fish in front of me and healing the sick, there is no way I wouldn't have believed. And how did anyone in that land not believe? It's interesting, isn't it? You think everybody would. If you were part of the 5,000 people sitting there and, and a basket with a couple of fish and a loaf of bread kept coming around and it just never went away, I'd be like, well, this guy, that's got to be God. Right? That's what you would think everybody would, would do. But it's interesting because when you read at Jesus' death, and I don't have an exact number, but if you were to count up, his followers at that point, it was probably it was it was a small church, 120 people. What happened to all those people? What happened? Because they're always wanting something. Always want something more, don't we? But here's the deal. Just so you know, so I know, so we can be reminded, God has not hold, held back one thing from us. Not only did He reconcile us to Himself, not only did He reconcile us to one another, not only did He forgive our sins and make a sacrifice that none of us could ever make, but in doing so, listen to this. Go on. 
This, this may be my favorite passage in the Bible. I say that about a lot. But this, this one I really like. Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to start in verse 3. The first two verses are just Paul greeting the Ephesian church, right? And it says, okay, stay with me on this. Just listen to every word here. And listen to every promise made. And then, and then tell me that your faith or that your relationship with God lacks one thing. Tell me you need a dream or a vision or anything else after we read this because there is nothing. I'm, I'm just going to give I'm just gonna give you the end game. There is nothing lacking. You're not missing anything. If you are in Christ, you are missing nothing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Okay, that ladder? That ladder? Everything up there, you got. Every blessing in heaven, you have. It's yours. It just said so. Yeah? It didn't say some. It said every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Christ He has blessed us. Hey, and He's even determined that we fulfill the purpose that we were created for to glorify Him. That's what that just said. In love, He predestined. Sometimes we get hung up on predestination and election and all these things. Look, these are beautiful. Beautiful. Paul is not making an argument here. He's stating facts. Okay, He's, he's not having a discussion with the Ephesians. He's stating facts about who you are in Jesus Christ. In Him... We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for Him, things in heaven, well, I'm sorry, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Uh, you got enough? You want more? All right, I'll give you more. In Him we have obtained an inheritance. Okay, Jacob, inheritance, right? The land. Hey, in Him, in Christ, we have an, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Oh, come on. Come on! He set His affections on you that you might be to the praise of His glory. Do you need another purpose to live for? He just gave us everything. He says, your purpose on this world is for my glory. There is no greater purpose on earth than to live for His glory. Not done. In Him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. A lot of for his glory in there, right? This is this is this is the beautiful thing about scripture. Whenever you're struggling to figure out what does this mean for me, what does this not mean for me, how do I apply this to my life? The first thing to ask yourself is how does it glorify God? Because that is the purpose in which I was created, that is the purpose of which I was redeemed, that is the purpose of the blessings, those spiritual blessings, they're for his glory, you see. We, we get confused because we want to flip things and we want to say, well, first my good, then your glory. No, our glory. 
His glory is our good. That's how it works. His glory is our good. It's not our desires. It's not things, stuff. I said I love baseball. I love baseball. I love watching it. I, I even love playing it still. I can, but I love it. And when I get around it, I get excited. And I, but you want to know something? When I watch a baseball game, when I watch my favorite team play baseball, after nine innings, it's over. And whether they won or lost, it's kind of, I might be upset. Oh, these guys want to swing the bat, you know, and I might lament during the game. But when it's over, it's gone. This right here, this thing that, that's been given us, this inheritance, this, this redemption that we've received, it isn't fleeting. Paul doesn't say anywhere in here that, hey, on Tuesdays you don't get this. <laughs> or you only get this on Sunday when you gather with God's people. No! This is who we are in Him. I mean, keep your dreams, right? I mean, I don't take them, but you know what I mean. I, I, it's like there's nothing lacking for us. We don't have to read narratives and, and stories in the Old Testament and go, man, I wish I had that. We don't have to think about, I wish I lived, you know, with Christ. I wish I could, what you are, you, you are walking. In Christ, if you are in Christ, He has it. The very last thing it says here is that He gave us His Spirit as a guarantee for the inheritance that we have. Listen, I know it doesn't always feel this way. It doesn't always feel this way for me, and I'm sure it doesn't feel this way for any of us all the time. But the Spirit is always indwelling in me. I sometimes have a hard time hearing it. But that does not negate the promises of God. It doesn't negate the spiritual blessings that I have in Him. I get in the way of that sometimes. I make it hard to listen to Him. But it's there. The Spirit is there. I do walk with Jesus. Right? He dwells in me. And maybe when it's hard to hear... Maybe that's why we set a stone up and put oil on it and fell on our faces and worship. Sometimes we just worship because we feel good, but sometimes maybe we need to worship when it's hard to hear. Because this chapter, or this, this passage right here, and I wish I could do this, but I can't because I don't have the lung capacity. But, but when, Paul, when Paul wrote this, right there. It's like when you translate it in English, they got periods and commas. There is no periods and commas. It's like this is just, like he just said this all in one breath. I've tried it. I, it, I, I can't do it, you know, but, but that's how that's written is that he just woo, and just compounded blessing and blessing and blessing after one another and, he, and, and he's driving home this point. You lack nothing in Christ. Nothing. sure we've been given everything. Right? So maybe maybe a day when I go home I'm going to try not to complain. And instead I'm just going to worship. Right? And I'm just going to sit at his feet and say, man, you've given me everything. Everything. I have everything. I lack nothing in you. Nothing. I promise you, David Jacob, I will feed you, I will clothe you, I will take care of you, I will always be with you. That, that, that's my promise too. That's your promise. That's our promise. And it's been sealed and guaranteed by the Spirit that dwells within us. Amen? amen. And amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. Oh man, thank you just for that reminder of all that we have in you. Thank you that... that uh, we don't need to feel like our faith is lacking. 
or that uh, we're missing out. Um, or it's true, we sometimes get in our own way, we are easily distracted, but we have everything we need in you. And uh, for that, Lord, I just give you praise. And uh, oh, and I would just pray for each of us that at some point today we would just stand in awe of you. That we would just take a moment and just contemplate the awesomeness of our God. We love you so much. I pray your blessing upon each one here, Lord, that, uh, that you would help each of us to walk a little closer with you this week, to talk a little more with you this week, and to love you a little deeper. I pray this in your most precious beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Alright. Thank you, guys.